So, as you guys can tell, I am not Don, and he was, he was going to be preaching today, but then I, I found out that I was going to be here, and it's, it's a long story. Uh, our moving van is delayed because there's a million things happening. Anyway, we're here, and the Lord blessed and, and made a way because we had been praying about Yasmin's baptism. We had wanted to do her and Lindsay together, but, you know, with travels and different things happening, and, and, and in the end, it all worked out. Uh, and we're just excited to see God moving uh, in all of this. And you guys get a chance to put up with me one last time. So, um, I invite you to bow your heads and pray with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, here we are. Lord, I'm just so glad to see so many young people. Not just showing up for church, but up front leading out. Lord, and they were only able to do this because they came in all week and worked hard every day for hours. Learning and memorizing and doing this, Lord, in order to be able to worship you and to bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, I want to thank you for using children. I want to thank you for dedicated family members, parents, aunts and uncles. And Lord, I want to thank you for the volunteers. Uh, it's, it's summer. They, they have things to do, Lord, but they chose to be here spending hours with these kids so that they could have a chance to worship you and to learn about you. And Lord, as we come together to continue to worship and to continue to study, and as we're going to be looking at the Bible, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just guide me as, as I lead out in this, but also be with everyone uh, that we may grow and learn as we study your Bible. Uh, we pray that you be with us, that you answer our prayers, uh, that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open to Isaiah chapter 6. So to the best of my ability, I have been trying to pack. It's not been a, a straightforward experience. But in between things, you know, I've been packing and putting things away. And as I was going through my things here in the church office, I found all kinds of neat things. Um, there are some cards that you guys gave me my very first Sabbath here. And I got a chance to go through those and read those. And it's different now because I know who everybody is. Like when I first got the card, I was like, oh, this is nice. I, I have no idea who these people are for the most part. But, you know, it was really nice. And then as I was going through different papers and, and different things, I found uh, handwritten, it was a, a piece of just regular copy paper folded in half and handwritten notes for the very first sermon I ever wrote and prepared myself and preached in English. So the story goes, I, was, I had just finished my freshman year of theology at Southern and I was working, uh, we call it canvassing or co-portering, that's when you go door to door selling Christian books. And it's like being a missionary right here in the United States. And if you've ever, anybody here ever experienced going door to door selling Christian books? Okay, a few. All right. That, that was one of the ways that I paid for my education. Um, and let me tell you, it, there is something that happens to you when you're going door to door to door. You never know what you're going to run into, what kind of experience people are having. And I had people open their doors and they're in tears because they're just praying, asking for God for some guidance. And then I show up in their house and I've shown up and had people, you know, cuss me out and kick me out and threaten to shoot me. So all kinds of things happen when you're doing it. And one thing that I took away from that is I definitely prayed a lot more, more than I had ever prayed in my life. I think from that point, the only time in my life after that, that I prayed more was when I was getting married. But, you know, before that, it was the, uh, my wife was late an hour. So you can imagine I had lots of time to pray uh, about her showing up for our wedding. And that's for a different story. But we were sleeping in the church. And many of you remember, we had some co poor staying here and sleeping in, in our church. And, and this was, I think it was in uh, Ohio, if I'm not mistaken. And I don't remember the name of the church. I didn't write it on my notes, but there was this small church there and the boys were sleeping in the church and the girls were staying in the house of one of the members. This lady uh, was older. All her kids had left and she had like five bedrooms in her house. So the girls were sleeping there. So as I was there, the pastor was gone for some reason. 
And then he was looking for somebody to preach. And then they found out that I was a theology major. But let me remind you, I was a freshman theology major. And the freshman is just a freshman. It, like, it doesn't matter what major you are. You're just a freshman. You don't really know anything. And I had just taken uh, Hebrew 1 and Hebrew 2. I hadn't even taken a preaching class yet. Um, because at Southern, they make you take the languages. And then the exegesis class, which is a class how to study the Bible. And then you can take preaching. So I hadn't even taken preaching. And like, okay, you know, you, do you want to preach? And I was like, ah. Uh, and then the, the pastor was like, no, no you, you should preach. And it's going to be great. And, and then he left. And, and there I was, you know, like, what do I even preach on? And I have no idea. And I, I grew up here in the state. Well, I grew up in Brazil, but the part of my life here in the United States from 13 and up, I've been always going to a, a Portuguese-speaking church. So I had never preached in English. And the sermons I had preached in Portuguese, my dad had, you know, written most of it for me. So I remember that for Hebrew class, Hebrew 1 and 2, we spent the two semesters translating Isaiah chapter 6. And I thought, well, I know that passage really well. <laughs> so I, I got my, my little paper, and that's the paper that I found, and I wrote verse 1, right? And I wrote some notes, and then verse 2, and I wrote some notes, verse 3. And then I got up in front of the church, and I just kind of went through verse by verse through my notes. And it's like the worst sermon ever. Little did I know, eventually, I would end up preaching like that. You know, I do now with stories, and I think I do a little bit better than, than what I did back then. I think my dad has the cassette recording of that sermon. Because somebody recorded it, and I gave it to my dad um, later on in life because I didn't have any cassette players uh, anymore. So this was my very first sermon, Isaiah chapter 6. And I invite you to turn your Bibles and, and open them to that because there's some really interesting insights that come from this chapter. And I didn't really touch on them the first time that I preached, but I think uh, with experience there is uh, a new appreciation for this text. So I hope that you can join me. Isaiah chapter 6, starting with verse 1, says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. So let's stop there real quick. You know, it's interesting that this is like the introduction to Isaiah being called to ministry. And it's happening in chapter 6. So it's, it's an odd place to place this. And, and it's like you, you get an idea for the year, for the time, you know, in history when this is happening. And we don't know what Isaiah was doing. Maybe he was asleep. And the thing that he sees is God in his temple. And the train of his robe. Does anybody know what a train of a robe is? Because as a guy growing up, like I had no idea until my wife was talking about wedding dresses. And I realized the train is like that thing that keeps going, right? So, so I, this helps me imagine this. You know, there's God sitting in the temple. And his robe just kind of keeps going and fills up the whole thing. So you can't tell where God ends and where the building begins. It just kind of fills the whole place, right? And as he is there, we have these seraphim, which is interesting because a, a, a seraph is, is a burning one, and seraphim is just, you know, making it plural. So there's these burning beings. You know, how do you describe this? He just sees this thing, and there's light coming from it, and the only thing he knows that has light coming from it is fire. So it says, yes, there's these beings and they're on fire and they're there in the presence of God and they have wings. But it's not just two wings. They have a set of wings to cover their face, a set of wings to cover their feet and two wings to fly. And these beings do one thing to one another back and forth. They say what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. There is something about catching a glimpse of God and that desire that comes to worship God, to sing, to praise. And sometimes we don't feel that desire because perhaps we haven't taken the time to notice God. 
As he witnesses God, they, they, these beings, they can't help it. They just, they just worship God. Why are they covering their face? Because God is holy. And there's something about, you know, approaching the presence of God and just feeling unworthy to be there. Why are they covering their feet? Interesting thing. In the Middle East, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this. Some of you older ones will remember this. When they toppled the statue from Saddam Hussein, people were going up to it and smacking the statue with what? Does anybody remember that? Their shoes. Right? It's the most offensive thing you can do. Right? You don't point with your feet to anything. That's incredibly offensive. Right? You don't step over anybody. You don't step on things. It's very offensive. I remember one professor. He said uh, he had just come. Uh, this is Dr. Dr. Saman, who used to teach here at Southern, he retired now. And he's like the most mild tempered, friendliest, like amazing man ever, right? And he's like five foot nothing, always smiling, very soft spoken, great man. And if you ever had a chance to meet him, and he says that at one point he was teaching, I think he was academy, he was teaching just high school. He preached here. Okay, so many of you maybe had a chance to meet him. He says he's teaching um, academy. And there is this one student that just, you know, as they're getting books in and out, they're getting their Bible, the Bible falls on the floor. And then he like, he puts his foot over the Bible. And at that point, Dr. Saman just lost it. I don't think he was a doctor yet at the time, right? Like the teacher, you know, and he lost it. And he just went off on that student and gave him a lecture and picked up that Bible because he grew up in the Middle East. And, and he knows that you don't put your feet on things that you're supposed to respect. And this child had put his feet on the Bible. And he said, in my country, people died for just reading the Bible or wanting to read the Bible. You can't do things like this. And so there is this whole idea, right? So these angels are covering their feet. They're in the presence of God. And you have to understand the vision also correlates culturally to something that would make sense to the audience of Isaiah. They're in the presence of God. They cover their feet. They cover their face. They're singing back and forth, holy, holy, holy. And now verse 4, just imagine this in your mind. Verse 4 says, And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So the post of the door, the professor who was teaching this class, he was, his strong point really is in archaeology. And he says the posts of the door uh, are fundamental parts of the home. Sometimes when the house burns down, when they're digging up a place, one of the things that they first find or recognizes the post of the door because it's such a strong solid foundation so it says if this is shaking the whole place is shaking this is serious worship this is not like holy 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 you know kind of like sometimes we sing right we show up at church and we kind of mumble along as the hymn is being sung and then but like they were singing and they're worshiping and the whole thing is shaking there's smoke and filling up the whole place and isaiah thinks to himself verse 5 about time God recognizes how special I am and brings me right to his presence. Is that what happens there in verse 5? Isaiah thinks, well, I'm so much holier than everybody else. That's why God chose me. Is that what happens? Verse 5, the very first thing that comes to Isaiah's mind, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am destroyed you know the creation you know just the opposite of that the undoing of someone and he feels this way why because i am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts so this man who is the one that god chose to do something very special finds himself in the presence of god in a vision and he thinks he's going to die because beholding God, he realizes, I am so full of faults. And it's not even that he has done anything terrible. What has gotten him in trouble? According to his own words, his lips, the things that he says. Sometimes as Christians, if you've been a Christian long enough, you can do pretty good in keeping your hands from doing anything evil, right? Right? We just use our mouth. And I mean, it can do so much more damage than our hands sometimes. I always say like, oh, it's not hurting anybody. It's just words. But Isaiah becomes convicted. I have misused my words. My lips have uttered things that should never have come out of uh, the lips of someone who loves God. It says not only that, I'm surrounded by people with unclean lips. And as Isaiah realizes that and fears for his life being in the presence of a holy God, as he speaks these words, the angels and God realize their mistake. And they say, we can't use this man. He has unclean lips. Is that what happens in the story? 
Like, oh, man, send them back. Bring somebody else. He has unclean lips. Okay, Isaiah, you have one week, you know, to clean up your act, you know, wash your mouth with soap, you know, and then, and then come back here and we'll give you a second chance. Right? We'll do another interview. Is God concerned that Isaiah is less than perfect at this point? No. Isaiah is there. He recognizes, I'm not worthy for this position. I'm not worthy for this calling. And let me tell you, for some of you who are leaders in this church or considering a leadership position, you have this desire to lead. Let me tell you, some of the best leaders that I have ever worked with were men and women who felt like they could not do it on their own. They weren't good enough. Some of the people that have given me the most trouble in my life are the ones who knew everything. If you find someone who knows everything, be careful. It can be tricky dealing with people like that. So Isaiah says, I, I don't know. I can't do this. I, I'm, not, I'm not perfect. There's issues in my life. And look at verse 6, the answer to Isaiah's recognition that he is not fit to serve God. Verse 6 is, one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand what? A live coal. What's a live coal? Hot coal, right? Where was a live coal? In the fire. Okay, good. So we understand the idea of a live coal. So he, he brings this live coal, which means it was just taken from the fire. And it ex the verse explains it, which had been taken with tongues, because it's hot, from where? From the altar. Now let me ask you this. This is the time of Isaiah, right? Has Jesus been born yet? Not yet. So what's in place in Israel at the time? They have what? Sacrificial system. Right, we're sort of familiar with that. The sacrificial system means that you bring an animal and the animal dies in behalf of the sinner. You know, traditionally a lamb, but it could be a goat. It could be, you know, there's different things, different sacrifices. But there's this idea of substitution. That means someone, something dies in my place. So in heaven, apparently, in the sanctuary, they also have a um, altar. And there's a fire burning there, and he brings the tongues from that altar, touched the mouth of Isaiah with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. What has happened? Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Let me ask you, did Isaiah do anything to deserve this? But this is the Old Testament. Is this a sacrifice that Isaiah offered up in heaven? No. No. Nothing to do with him, right? He was chosen. He shows up there. He recognizes he's not good enough. An angel goes to the altar, brings the coal to him from the sacrifice that we, we don't hear much about. But there's this idea, something's going to happen or something happened or there's something about this altar that cleanses me. Not because I deserve it. Not anything that I did. Something that was done for me. And the moment he is cleansed and that his sin is purged, and, and just let me talk about this a little bit more. This is the Old Testament. But you know what I see here? I see grace. I see Isaiah being there because of grace, because of what God is willing to do for him, because of Jesus who would one day die for him. And that sacrifice already cleansing Isaiah at that point. Not anything that he did, something that was done for him. And once his lips, once his iniquity is taken away, once his sin is purged, which is interesting, the iniquity and the sin seems to be just, you know, his lips was enough to make him unworthy and to need to be cleansed. So just the things that we say, yes, it's bad enough that it requires a sacrifice of Jesus. And once his sin is taken away, he hears what? The voice of the Lord. You know, if I could expand on this, expound on this a little bit. We just watched baptism take place, right? And not too long ago, Gabby got baptized as well. Not too long ago, uh, Lindsay got baptized. And we, we see these baptisms taking place, which is great. It's a sign that the Holy Spirit is moving. But look at what happens when you accept God and your sins are washed away. You come out of that baptism, a new creature, a new girl, a new man, a new person in Christ, born again Christian. You know what you should hear. The voice of God calling you to action. They hear the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Which is interesting. Jesus hasn't shown up in the picture yet. 
God's referring to himself here as us. It's something to think about. But the moment we are saved, we are saved for the sake of a mission. God saves us, and then he asks, who's going to go for us? You see, there is this problem. If God shows up here on earth, you know what happens with people? It's going to be just like with Isaiah. I am undone, right? He shows up here in church, and then we all turn to dust. It, just, it doesn't work, so he needs people to go in his behalf. Who is going to go for us? I have cleansed you. I have taken away your iniquity. Your sin is purged. Are you willing to go for us? And the amazing thing is that Isaiah forgets all about being, having unclean lips. and doing, He trusts that God forgave him, that God took that away. And he says, ooh, 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 pick me. I'll go. I will go, Lord. I will serve you. I am willing to go and do this for you because you have taken away my sin. You have saved me. You have given me this new life, this new birth, and I am willing to go for you. Then he said, go. And tell this people, and then the verse gets, the chapter gets really weird. It takes a weird turn. Up to now, everything makes sense. God says, okay, here's the message. Here's what you're going to go. And this is what you're going to do. And we come to verse 9. It says, he said, you will go and tell this people, keep on hearing but not understanding, keep on seeing, but not perceiving. Make the heart of, his, of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Now, that's, that's not a very nice message. That seems to be the opposite of what we should be doing. And this is where context is very important. We have to look at what was happening that's why this doesn't begin in the very beginning of Isaiah. It comes in chapter 6 because there's some things going on. And you have to keep that in mind by the time this message comes along. You see, Isaiah wrote this in the setting of the Syro-Ephraimite War. And he was expressing in dramatic fashion his opposition to King Ahaz's trust in the king of Assyria rather than in God. So the king has been warned by Isaiah to trust in God. Instead, he has chosen to trust the king of Assyria. And this has been going on for a while, and God is frustrated with him. And Isaiah has this message, which is the equivalent of shock therapy. Okay, you're going to show up, and you're going to tell him exactly what he's doing. And I'm guilty of doing this sometimes with my children. And it's not a good thing. My wife corrects me on it. I see them doing something that's not very smart. And I say, oh, good job. Keep doing it. Let's see how much worse it'll get. You know, she's like, don't talk to your children like that. I'm, like, I'm sorry. But it's like, what do you think is going to happen? So this is what Isaiah is doing. He shows up and says, yeah, keep doing it. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be destroyed. You're going to keep turning away from God, and you're not going to hear his voice anymore. And if you have been involved in ministry, you have found yourself in a similar situation at some point. Maybe sometimes even with your own family members or co-workers or friends where you share them about the will of God and God's plan for their life. And it's like they do the exact opposite. And things don't turn out very well. And then they come by complaining, oh, I got hurt. It's like, well, I'm trying to warn you. I tried to tell you this is not the way for you to go. And the next thing you know, they're doing the same thing again. Oh, but this time it will be different. And they get hurt again. And you're like, what else can I do? And God is telling Isaiah, you keep preaching you keep sharing the truth the truth doesn't change but there is this chance that something might happen let me let me continue reading so isaiah is like lord this is not very exciting as a mission this is not a good call to action uh, how long do i have to do this verse 11 how long O lord and god answered until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitants the houses are without man and the land is utterly desolate in other words, as long as there is people to listen, you keep telling them. And once there's nobody to listen anymore, you can stop. Which means that our call to share the gospel, it goes on. How long should I share? As long as there is people to listen. If there's people around you, you keep sharing. But they're not listening. They're doing the opposite. Yes, you keep sharing. 
By telling Isaiah this, God already got ahead of him and prevented him from finding any excuses to quit. Because what are our excuses to quit? Well, I tried and it didn't work. Therefore, I'm going to stop. Right? I tried with my children. I tried with my neighbor. I tried with, and nobody's listening, so I'm just going to stop. I've been coming to church for all these years and nothing seems to change, so I'm just going to stop going. And according to God talking to Isaiah, it's like, no, you don't get to stop. Even if nobody's listening, you continue to do what I'm asking you to do. Why? Verse 13, the very last verse. But yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. When it's all said and done, there is a remnant. This is something that we believe in as Adventists. This is something that we see throughout the Bible. There's always a remnant. There's always a group that remains faithful. And the thing is, you don't know who that group is. So you continue to do the work, trusting in the word of God that it will accomplish what it's meant to accomplish. You may not witness the success or the, the outcome that you desire from your labor. I don't think Isaiah ever got to see it. But you know what? We're still reading his writings to this day. And the things that he said were going to happen, happen. And some of the reasons that we know that Jesus is the Messiah is thanks to the things that Isaiah said, even though he went through most of his life feeling like a failure. Like it didn't make any difference. Like he only made enemies, but he remained faithful to God. Now, I just want to clarify here, I don't want you to see this as a call to go and make enemies in the name of God. That's not the case. He was dealing with a specific example. But the thing is, as you're sharing the gospel, you can't help it. You're going to make some enemies along the way because some people just don't want to listen. They're just not interested. If you focus on those, you're going to lose heart. You have to remember there's that 10%. There's that 10th. Right, that tithe that remains. There is that tree stump that will be there after the tree is removed. There's going to be some people who are going to listen. It's going to change their lives. And, you know, eventually the Messiah would come through Israel and would bring, bring salvation to the whole world. So the plan of God was still going to march forward. The call to Isaiah was to be faithful, even if you feel like it's not making a difference. Even if you feel like a failure. Even if you feel like people are just doing the opposite of what you're asking them to do. According to God's call to Isaiah, keep going. Why? Because he got a glimpse of God's glory. He realized God is real. And he realized being there in the presence of God, that God, if you want me to do, I'll do whatever you desire because you took away my iniquity. You cleanse me from unrighteousness. So as God offers me his salvation that I don't deserve, I am then willing to live my life for him. It's not easy. It's not always straightforward. But it is what God calls us to do. We may not all be like Isaiah preaching the way that he did, but we're all called to share in some way according to the gifts that we have received. And if you were to talk with the amazing volunteer team that we saw up here about, you know, their experience with VBS, I'm sure they will share with you. There were challenging moments. There were stressful moments. There were moments that you were tired and you said, why did Grace schedule this so early in the morning? <laughs> but in the end, it's worth it. We may not see how all these children will grow up. We don't know what's going to happen 30 years from now, 10 years from now. But we do our part as it comes to our hand. If I'm able to go, if it fits with my gift in this, I'm just going to show up. I'm going to do something for God. I think that this call from Isaiah, challenging as it is, I think there's lessons that we can take from it and apply it to our lives. It's not about being perfect. If you're going to wait to be perfect to do something for God, you're going to wait forever. We show up and we let the coal from the altar, in our case, the cleansing blood of Jesus, to just cover us and cleanse and says, Lord, here I am. Send me. What would you have me do? Maybe I can't do VBS. Kids, I don't know, it doesn't work out. But can you do something else? What can you do? And let's show up and make things happen. One of them, as Sharon mentioned, is, you know, just spreading the mulch so the kids can play. It may seem like a little thing. Let me tell you, the kids will be grateful. 
that somebody showed up to help with that. And all of us, we give what we're able to give. Not everybody has the same gifts, and God meant that. It's on purpose. We're just supposed to look at what we can do and show up and just do our part. And don't get discouraged. And know it's going to be hard ahead of time. But like God said, even if nobody listens, you're called to preach. You're called to share. You're called to do your part. Leave the results with God. We do the best that we can. We hold on and we keep going because of what God did for us first.